Okay, welcome back to another episode of Behind the Business. I'm your host, Ryan Drake, and today we have Lockie Stewart in the house. Lockie is the founder of The Man That Can Project, a leading men's personal breakthrough company here in, well, what started in Southeast Queensland and is now in Nashville in the States. And Lockie has coached over 800 men over the last 10 years. Um, on how to gain their confidence, to be their most authentic self and adopt a man that can attitude and mindset through foundational and breakthrough workshops. Um, What I really love about the work that Lockie is doing as well is that his events challenge and empower men to break through limitations. And rather than, I don't know, fluffy PD events that you go to and you finish on a high, uh, really leaving, <laughs> really leaving men with this profound sense of um, achievement and identity shift through his work. Um, and the other element that I'm sure we'll dive into today with Lockie as well is he's also a fitness fiend and has recently represented Australia in the Obstacle Course Racing World Championships. Welcome to the show. Ryan, thanks for having me on. I had to, sorry to interrupt your uh, introduction with a bit of laughter there, but it was a brilliant introduction and we definitely not about the uh, leaving, blowing, pumping your tires up and not having an idea or plan on how you're going to make some change. So pumped to be here and looking forward to getting into it. Uh, Lockie, let's start there because I think having been in this in the personal development space myself for goodness me, just over 10 years, yourself 10 years as well. We've seen uh, trends and cycles and all these different things happen. Um, And I don't know about you, but I witness, and it's just interesting to observe, um, course junkies, uh, event whores, if we could say that, right? Basically people getting getting high. (laughs) Yep on continually going through these um, these cycles and the event and signing up and the next thing and the next thing and like just pumping themselves full of information. What would you say um, is some of the work that you do with the men that you coach to help them move through just more information and lead to identity level change for them? It's so definitely a great place to start. And I, I recognize that was an issue literally 10 or nine, 10 years ago, because I started first off in personal development and I kept going to different events because I was excited about what I was learning. And I would notice the same people would keep coming. And eventually I started building relationships with these people and they would continue coming back and nothing had changed. But my life was continuing to elevate. And then I started men's groups and similar thing, you know, I wanted to help um, at the time I was really focused on stopping men taking their life by suicide. And we started attracting mm-hmm. people who were, you know, down in the depths and it felt good to validate where they were at, but they weren't doing anything, right? They just kept coming back with the same problems. And I recognized one, I didn't want to swim around in that sort of area because it was pulling me down. So I realized that in order to make myself feel better, I had to help them feel better. And talking, look, talking is an important part and upskilling is an important part, but, you know, knowledge is power is bullshit. Knowledge is potential power. The implementation is what makes you powerful. So when you become an individual who starts working towards something and, you know, we all got to set our own compass around what we feel we want in life, we then have to start learning the thing, right? Whatever that looks like. And then once we've then learned the thing, we have to start implementing it. Right? Because once we start implementing it, we realize what the real holdup is. Because you could jump on Google right now, Ryan, and learn anything, how to launch an ad, how to overcome a limiting belief, how to get fit, how to drop 10 kilos, right? There's processes and formulas everywhere. But what stops people is the psychology and the implementation, which is the fear of X. And mm-hmm. when people then go to do the thing and stop doing it it's like okay why am i not doing that and that's how we then get people to do that thing because it's action based let's push you through that that's how people have personal breakthroughs right and i know we'll probably take the conversation in the area of fitness at some point ryan because you were i saw on your instagram you just finished crossfit this morning and 
one mm. thing that I love about CrossFit and training in general is that it pushes you to have those little wins, whether it's, you know, lifting 0.25 more on a, a clean or, or doing a wad a little bit faster, you're breaking limits, right? And you're proving to mm. yourself you're more capable than you first thought. Yeah. And what would you, you know, you've, you've coached hundreds and hundreds of men uh, over the last decade. And I think the men's work is very different from what I witnessed to be women's work. I have a lot of female clients as well who come and see me for different reasons. But I find, you know, men, men face quite unique challenges today, particularly around this, this shift in identity on a societal level. Mm -hmm. and their place um we we know the rates of men's suicide in australia and across the west what would you say is the kind of the biggest thing that you see some of the men that come to you primarily struggle with if if you you pull away at the situation and you're looking at the core thing that they often face is there a consistent story or pattern that you end up seeing yes and if we were to stri strip away i guess the specific situations whether it's an obsession of work or avoid it it's discipline people mm. a lot of men will come to us it's either their marriage is falling apart um they're burnt out at work they're you know overweight and run down <clears throat> a lot of it happens because they know they want to be better most men know that they should be giving time to their partners or their, their families. Most men know that they should be exercising. Most men know that they should be working on their own stuff. But many of them aren't doing that. And it's because they're not doing that that so many more issues are popping up in their life. You know, choosing to go to the pub on a Friday afternoon to blow off some steam instead of going home and helping the family at home, that's going to create more friction in your relationships, which then creates another problem. So. We, when we, we're looking at, I guess, men that are coming to us, they're looking for a solution, right? They're looking for a way to remove some pain from their life. And that's unique to every individual. And I guess we're all wired and hardwired to get away from pain. That's why we've created such a comfortable environment we live in, right? I know in Brisbane at the moment, it's like a ridiculous heat wave. And I guarantee you most people are um, turning the aircon on, they're just getting comfortable, right? Yeah. They don't want to sweat. They don't want to feel uncomfortable, yeah? And yeah. it's the same. Sure. We've been minus 24 here in Nashville. The pool's froze over. Dude, I've been running in the snow, and not because I want to pretend I'm a fucking cool person, but because I know that I will may never have the opportunity to do it again. But for me, it's like the comfort is staying inside, running on a treadmill where it's warm, and that's what mm -hmm. everyone else is doing. If we continue to do what everyone else is doing, we're going to get the same results. And if we look at the statistics, Ryan, you mentioned the number of suicide. We can also look at divorce rates. We can look at people who are medicated, who don't have purpose, who have poor friendship circles. I don't want to be like function. I don't want to be one. another number. Oh, dude, dude, 100%. Exactly. So I don't want to be one of those numbers, which means I have to do differently to those other people. Mm. Same with those men. And they're coming to me for solutions. It's really interesting. So if we, it's really interesting that you say discipline as well, because I was very curious about some of these statistics. Why is it that, and I, and I isolate this to the West because we actually don't see disease rates and divorce rates in the East in the same way we experience it in Western countries. So if we keep it to that region, um, I'm not, have you seen clips Lockie on, on socials about uh, school kids in the sixties, like going and doing PE and everyone is ripped. Like, you know, your, your high yeah. school teenagers, they're just on the abs. They're doing the monkey bars. You're doing drill drills. You have this <laughs> discipline um, instilled in you. <clears throat> from a very young age mm -hmm. uh and yeah i think as a society like we've grown up with all of these comforts um what if a man have you have you read sorry just to to jump in because i think yeah there's a lot of problems that are in front of us around 
how people are, whether it's mental resilience, their ability to problem solve their weight, um, mental health issues. And a really good book for you to read is iGen and Generation. So two books um, co-authored by John, Dr. Jonathan Haidt, who wrote The Happiness Hypothesis, right? So he's okay. been using Substack, if you're familiar with Substack. Yep. And he's been going on there with, I think, Carol Dweck and um, someone else. And they've been writing these books on there, like asking questions, getting feedback. But they've spoken about how the times in which we live have really also influenced the next generations because it is very easy. And I was this person until I started reading this book, asking why. I was like, man, that next generation's screwed. You know, they're soft. They can't do with this. Like they're entitled. And there's actually some, a lot of influence from our parents and the way society is structured. You know, you think about when we were younger, um, Ryan, I don't know about you, but I could walk to school, I could ride home, you know, there wasn't much fear yeah. around being abducted or anything like that, right? And so my parents would make me work for a little bit of pocket money, I could then roll down to the shop, learn how to spend it, you know, I'd buy some lollies, yeah. and then I, which mean that I couldn't have a juice or whatever. So I was learning these little skills that were setting me up for life. Now what happens is people are so fearful that their kids are going to get abducted or, you know, they don't want them to um, have a mental breakdown. So they'll just give them pocket money. So they don't have mm. to work for anything, but it's come from what we've been conditioned to believe and we're only doing what we believe is going to best serve our children. However, we're taking away skill sets that then should be developing to function well in the real world. And so now you've got kids or, or teenagers, for example, who don't feel comfortable leaving their house, right? There's a whole city in Japan, not a whole city, but a community of people about half a million people that haven't left their house for over six months. I oh, wow. cannot remember the name of it now. But so the way the world's working is like, it's not a, you know, look, obviously we can look at the fact of let's take responsibility. If I'm in a position where I am overweight and I don't feel comfortable in social situations, I'm struggling with social anxiety. Okay, I'm responsible for that. I need to develop those skills. Yes, of course. But for people who are maybe under 18 and who are at the, I guess, guidance of their parents, it's like, okay, as the parent, and I think this may be helpful for your audience, mm. if you are a parent, are you over coddling your children and not allowing them to learn the lessons that allow them to be independent, to develop the ability to problem solve, to think critically about their actions? Like this, <clears throat> you know, we are worried. We're all worried about where the world's going, you and I both and a lot of people. but what's the role that we're playing in is, is really important to think about it. And that's for me is like we come back to our, I guess, you know, the influence that you have with your podcast and I have with mine and the people that I work with. I'm like, okay, yep, we, we get so much news. We see what's happening in the wars around the world, but we can't directly influence that. Mm. So let's stop using the fear of that to determine the decisions we're making at home. Yeah, I sorry mean, for that tangent. I just felt I wanted to get oh, that book in there for you. It's it's really it's really interesting, and I'll add the book to the show notes because um, there's there's so many implications of what you said. So what I've read about some some of the things that are happening culturally in Japan is that you also have a decrease in the birth rate. You have people who are largely single, remaining single. Um, not engaging on on dates, and then also consuming passively. So you have um influencers who who are making ten fifteen thousand dollars a month live streaming themselves eating on Zoom, <laughs> and it's it's just wild to me. So yeah, so they they eat in front of the camera for three hours a day, and they're just printing money because. People don't want to go out and date. And so there's there's all these other social cues and fabric that break it down. It doesn't surprise me then that some people haven't left the house for so long. If we, and, and you know, the, ja the Japanese situation is very different. Of Their suicide rate is just as high as Australia. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, no, it's and, and so there's, I think there's other things happening there as well. Um, but if we, I guess if we bring it back to Australia too, I think these, we do see it and we see it at a, 
at a level now, like you mentioned, where there's participation awards handed out for everything. Teachers have, I guess, changed the pens that they use to mark, you know, good answers versus incorrect answers. So you can't even use like the red pen anymore in some situations. Um, oh my goodness. <laughs> It's it's pretty it's pretty wild. I guess um if if you have a man then who who has come to you and basically has said, Lockie, I don't have any discipline um in my life and, and I guess let's let's paint a realistic picture then. So what are some of the me- the, the challenges men are facing at the moment? I know that men are afraid of dating in Brisbane. <laughs> like I have friends who are really struggling to meet the right women. And then the women are saying, oh my gosh, like men in Australia, (laughs) awful. Um, Pornography, addictions. Um, And so if we, if we have someone knock on your door who is admitting and putting their hands up and saying, actually, look, I really need help because I recognize that my life's a mess. How would you start with them to instill that discipline? Because it might be totally foreign for them. Mm. So for me personally, when I look at discipline, people are disciplined. Everyone's disciplined. There's things that you're consistently doing that you maybe aren't even aware of. Even the fact that you're not keeping your word, you're disciplined at doing that. And that's how I would reframe it. Because in Mm. order to get on board with something, you need to find an area in your life where you're already doing it to go, okay, I believe I can do that. That makes sense. Okay. So for example, let's use, I want to be more disciplined with going to the gym. My idea is that I want to get up at 5am and hit that, you know, 5.30 CrossFit class. I'm just not disciplined. Whenever the alarm happens, I snooze and I've missed it. Okay. You're really disciplined at hitting the snooze button. So you need to find a way to remove the space between the thi- like the action and the decision to do the action. If you allow time to do that, more often than not, you're going to talk yourself out of it because it's not a habit, right? You don't unconsciously do it. You allow yourself to go, hmm, it's cold out or my, my knee's achy or I need a little bit more sleep. And then when that starts happening, most people don't have enough control over their thoughts yet to be able to then talk themselves to do what they need to do. So I would start there and then I look at what is the thing that you want to do and why is it important? The action. So for me and for a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are being diagnosed with ADHD at the moment. They say they can't focus. Okay. So for me, is it like, are we looking to remove the distraction or are we looking to focus more? Most people are looking to focus more. They aren't removing distractions. Okay, I, I get distracted. I believe I'm very productive, but I also get distracted when there's distractions around. Mm-hmm. So when I understand and I'm aware of the things that are holding me back from doing the thing I said I wanted to do, aka not being disciplined, I work out how I can remove that distraction. Because the less things I have to think about stealing my focus, I can then do the thing that I said I was going to do. So going back to that example, mm-hmm. I would say that I'm going to get up and do that five o'clock class. The next thing I could do is put my phone, you know, a couple of meters away from the bed. If you have the, you know, a big enough room to do that. So you have to get out of bed to turn it off. Your feet have hit the floor. Now you're up, you're up. The second thing, if that doesn't work for you, you then continue stacking like you would with habits. You go, okay, well, if I need a little bit more accountability, I might have someone that I've got to meet at the gym at 5.30 and they're going to hold me accountable. There's a consequence, right? You might have a friend, right? And this is where, you know, I guess paying for coaches and mentors becomes a little bit more beneficial. But if it's a friend, you know, sometimes depending on the standards of people that you're hanging around, but I would imagine the people listening to this show, Ryan, would be, have a certain set of standards where they would hold you accountable. But if they don't, you start then saying, hey, Ryan, I've missed the gym three times now, right? I'm really trying to develop the habit of getting to this CrossFit class with you. I know you're showing up, but I'm not. Mm. Every time I miss the gym now, I owe you $10 or find something that's painful, right? Most people are struggling financially, so taking some money out of their pockets, why the gyms do the, the fee if you don't attend the class. Well, I think so it's let's great. find a way to do that yeah. and put more pain. Yeah, put more pain behind the thing that you know you should be doing, but you're not doing. 
because as we've said maybe 10 mm -hmm. minutes ago, most people come to me because they're trying to get away from pain in their life. So when you understand that, you just create pain. Like it may sound sadistic, but for me, it's how I achieve all the stuff that I'm doing. I'm just finding ways to create pain in my life to get closer to the pleasures that I want. And that it's, works really well to be disciplined. Yeah. I think, I think what you're also can, really can touching I, on I'll is I'll share you a, a real biology. So I was correct. just going to say, I like, dude, like, I, I've got a, no, you sorry, go. you go lucky. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll let you go. I'll, I'll come back to it. Oh, just, just human biology and, and the evolutionary nature of how we adapted. We're actually rewiring the brain with our comforts, which is what we're talking about. And you can't beat 200,000 years of evolution. So why don't you work with it? And if you can create this opportunity to introduce pain um, in a way that is also a motivator uh, and can work in your favor, whether that be accountability um, or, or, or whatever it is, like just make your your process more difficult. For example, simple one is take the stairs instead of the elevator. Just make it, you know, introduce it in a in an easy way every day, and you become accustomed to to life. What what's the saying? It's like um, hard. Hard choices, easy life. Easy uh, choices, hard life. Something to that effect. Yeah. Yes, I think of that. Yeah. It, you know, and one of the one of the best ways is post it on social media for accountability. Like, I believe social media is one of the most underutilized tools to get you to do what you said you were going to do. I document, and once again, I could be biased because I do document it. But I, I, you know, I love that when I put something out on social media. I do it because I'm like, if I don't do it today, people are going to know, okay? And mm. I'm relying on doing the thing that I said I would do, not only to get results, but to um, empower other people to do the same thing. We all have stuff pop up in the day. And I've got one of our members, um, he's been with us for three years. And this year, you know, he's had a huge growth in his business. And this year, a goal is to get his health back on track, okay? And so I was like, dude, I'm doing this thing where I'm doing something hard every day. The de definition of hard for us is you know, doing something that I necessarily probably am trying to avoid, but I know is going to benefit my life. So I'm going to do that. And he started doing that. He's on day 43, I think. And he's after like 30 days, he's like, man, I feel so confident. I'm so proud of myself from doing that. And it's like, it's the first time in his 37, I, I feel like I'm actually disciplined. His whole idea of how he thinks about himself now is I'm disciplined. Before that, I'm not disciplined. So the belief shift in his mind is now going to make him get better results. And not only for this challenge that for some may seem insignificant, but he's now going to carry that into business, into his relationships. Like, I'm disciplined. I do. I'm a man of my word. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I love that. I agree with you, I think, in terms of the, the social proof of being able to share publicly make a declaration because until you got skin in the game for most people their their goals are a wish i mean i'm sure you're very much the same i don't believe 98 percent of stuff that comes out of people's mouths i'll smile <laughs> but i yeah I, I, i'll wait until they they demonstrate and uh can can show show me something so i think that the the accountability is it works twofold one is it does hold you accountable and i think that's probably where 75 hard from a social aspect and a social experiment has been really profound because you can watch people in real time either succeed at it or they will tell you when they don't what threw them off and it's fascinating for me to understand mm -hmm. the psychology behind what that thing is and then for the person who does succeed it continues to reinforce the character building so it's like cool i am a man who can then follow through on my word i am someone who is then disciplined i am building like you're forging the character every every single day um and 
I think every day presents a hundred different opportunities to reinforce the person or the man that you want to become, as well as a hundred other ways to throw you off course. And it's the, it's the battle. Mm. I guess what I'm, what I find related to our early discussion too, is that if, if on a whole, if we have people who, I guess, soft, just for lack of a better word, don't like the discipline. If you see the spike in diagnoses for uh, ADHD, um, which again, I find interesting if we look at statistics and historical stuff as well, but just understanding, even if you do have a diagnosis, fantastic. What are you going to do with that? Because it's knowledge. Knowledge can be mm-hmm. turned into something. But if you recognize, okay, society as a whole in business or life, if people are distracted and people can't do hard things, it has never been easier for you to succeed. I think. It's crazy. I, uh, d- I definitely agree. I mean, when I walk around and I see obese dudes walking around who you can, t- you can tell when someone's not confident, Ryan, like by the way they walk, the way they shake hands, whether they look you in the eyes. There's so many things, and I don't care whether people say that's old school. Bullshit. Because I, when I see a man who holds himself well, can look you in the eyes, can shake your hand, like you know he's strong, he's confident. And the benefit of that, and look, we can talk um, culturally and their influence, right, which is extremely important, but even from a health perspective, I see so many men who don't have enough muscle, right, for good health. The more muscle mass you carry on your body, the better metabolic health you will have. So mm. when I see people who go, I don't need to train or I'm, you know, for whatever reason, I'm like, okay, well, that's okay. Look, how you choose to live your life is completely fine. It doesn't impact me. However, my goal and what I believe I'm here to do is to help those men who do want to have more influence and control over their life get their shit together. And the best place to start is by getting yourself in a position where physically you feel confident and empowered in who you are because that then determines how you show up in a room, how you go to close a sale, how you go on a date, right? how you lead your family, all of those things. Most men aren't prepared to lead, but they want to. They, they've adopted this responsibility once again, and I, I'm a big believer in being the provider, but I've also got a wife who's extremely successful as well, and I love supporting her and we support each other. So our relationship's a little bit different there, but I love to know that I can provide, okay? But mm. the other thing that I love knowing is that she can count on me because of the energy that I have, the vitality that, that I have, the discipline that I show up with, the standards that I carry as a man. And I've decided on the, and set those standards based on how I want to live my life and how I want to perceive myself, okay? I think that's the most important thing. So I'm not the person, Ryan, and... I know in the beginning we had a little bit of a laugh about like, I guess the soft style and fluffy style of men's, men's coaching. And then there's like the Andrew Tate's right. And I think we can learn stuff from both sides. And I think for anyone, yeah. And David Goggins, right. A hundred percent, those hard ass motherfuckers. And we can learn something from all of those people and every individual will be drawn to the place where they feel comfortable and that's completely fine. So I don't want to discredit that. I just, you know, I don't fit in those zones, right? I've got my own thing. For me, it's mm. about helping people work out what they want and understanding who they need to become and the standards that that version of themselves will carry and conduct on a day-to-day basis, right? Not just when it's convenient on a fucking day-to-day basis. When you understand that, that's where the discipline comes because it's like, okay, well, what would that version of me do at 5 a.m. in the morning? Well, I'd do what I said I'd fucking do, get out of bed, okay? Yeah. The thing is, um, Ryan, is most men from that fact don't really know. And it's not because they don't know what they want. A lot of people do know what they want. If you ask them, they'll say, man, I just want more time with my family. I want to drop 10 kilos. <clears throat> I just want a bit more, um, you know, I don't want to be as stressed, okay? I want to be able to articulate what I'm feeling. Cool. Right, their goals, they're amazing, and I love you to have them. Where people get stuck is they don't know how to fucking do it. And because we've stopped people learning the ability to problem solve, to think for themselves, 
they don't know how to do that. Ryan, in the last 10 days, right, I've had, well, including this week, I've had about 50 phone calls with guys joining our program. Wow. And Congrats, man. everyone That's comes awesome. on with the cool goals. Yeah. 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 Thank you. But everyone comes on, and this is the point I want to push home. Everyone comes on with a goal. As I said, the thing that they want, the desired outcome, which is what we want people to have. But they don't know how to get there. Like, if you say, How do you get there? They don't know. It's like, what do you need to do on a daily basis to get that thing? If you want to improve your marriage, what does that mean? I don't know. Okay, well, we need to figure that out because until we know, we've got no tangible thing for you to do mm. or for me to hold you accountable on. And that's where people get stuck. They feel so overwhelmed that they just then do nothing. So for a lot of people listening, you may have an idea of what you want, but it's even, you know, just the simple form for, for how to think about it is what would you need to do today to get that result? For example, in business, you know, if you want to get a new client, what do you need to do today? Well, <clears throat> need to have a sales call. Lockie, okay, can well, we, can we use you, you as an to have example? Happen to do that? Could yeah, we use you as an example? Because I think the, you know, the, one of the reasons why I was so ex so excited to have you on the show is because you model it. And so just for context, guys, um, Lockie's just moved halfway around the world. So from Brisbane over to Nashville with his wife, uh, he's competed for Australia in the obstacle course race, ran a marathon last year, um, runs his own podcast, you know, coached hundreds of people. So he's juggling lots and lots of things. Um, and also had to navigate the transition of life. So he mentioned earlier, you know, it's negative 25 degrees outside <laughs> running in the snow. It's uncomfortably hard. Lockie, could you paint a picture for us in the context of either some of the, your own mental, uh, barriers that you're breaking through at the moment around things that are you're facing in your business or life or marriage? Um, and how you navigate that for yourself. Yeah, awesome. And I've got to realize, oh, so I'll be very open. So last year I had my worst year in business in eight years. I lost a lot of money. And that put me, and obviously then moving, it's expensive to move to the US uh, with, with, you know, getting a house and the moving costs, flights, and then obviously the exchange rate is kicking me in the balls. So. I came over here financially stressed and because I'm really aware of that, I was able to navigate and have the conversations with my wife to share where I'm at, what's going on, what needs to happen in order for me to get X outcome, right? And that outcome was to not be financially stressed. Okay. We've moved city. We've moved across, you know, chasing opportunity. It's very hard to experience opportunity when you're stressed. So I knew the one thing that I had to do was to uh, get my business back right to where it was I knew right I know what the downfalls are I can't be drinking I love whiskey I'm in fucking bourbon country right here okay but I knew I've committed to 12 months off the booze because I know what I can achieve when I'm off the booze I've committed mm -hmm. to that work hours the number of calls all the stuff but I've also been able to communicate that with my wife and still make time for the things that are important so we talk about and you mentioned a moment ago Ryan all the things that can show up in a day. I know what I want, right? My one goal this year is to get our academy back to 300 members, which is about um, 80 grand a month. I know when I do that, I'm not going to be financially stressed anymore and I can do, you know, continue working on the other goals that I've set for myself. In order to get back to that, I have to be practicing and preaching what I'm doing. I got so comfortable two years ago where, you know, habits didn't necessarily drop, but I wasn't making as many phone calls. I wasn't showing up in the way that I should have been showing up. I'd got slack with my communication, hence the, the drop. I'd lost my assertiveness. So I learned a very valuable and a very expensive lesson, but I've been also very fortunate with the people that I work with, uh, very wealthy individuals, and they come to me looking for solutions, which means they have problems. I don't take for granted the fact that I get to learn their problems. They're in a position financially where I want to be, but I've seen the sacrifices that have been required, in, or maybe not even required, that they have chosen to have in their life as a result. 
So for me, I don't want to be on my fourth marriage, Ryan. I do mm. not want to sacrifice my health. Okay, I still want to have hobbies and be doing cool shit with cool people. Okay, so what that then means is I need to make sure that I'm making time for all of these things every week, but I need to be, um, have the energy and the, I guess the intention to really maximize that time because I'm going fucking hard at the moment. Okay. Yeah. How do you do that then? I think about, okay, well, how does the, I guess, the version of Lockie who's performing at such an elite level working? He's not sleeping in, man. And I've, dude, I've literally been cracking holes in our pool, which is frozen. And this is not to prove how hardcore I am, but because as any challenge you have, if you do the same thing consistently, you build up a tolerance, right? Or, or a plateau. You know, mm. an example, if you're doing 50 sales calls a day, you might, push up to 55 and eventually you're at 100 and it's like oh that's easy that's just what i do okay so for me jumping in you know minus three ice at the moment it's just what i do okay it starts my day i was doing it when it was 10 degrees people thought i was crazy here then and then all of a sudden when it's snowing they're like this guy's really crazy i'm like it's not i've just been going with the season so when you do anything consistently enough if it continues to get more challenging you'll do it so to bring it back around to your question, <clears throat> Ryan, with the adversity and how I've dealt, dealt with it, I've had um, you know a couple of relationship breakdowns and Amy was with me when I was at my worst 10 years ago. So she knows the growth that I've had and I've also been, you know, I owe a lot to her because of that. And so one of the commitments I made 10 years ago was that I would never be a terrible partner and I have an idea of what that looks like. So I have standards there and I've never dropped them. Ever and it's what does that got look to like? The point where that's just just, just for people, for people at home, because I, I find I find this really really interesting, um, and I wanted to provide some context because I'm loving this conversation. So one of my one of my mentors, um, I remember going on a walk with her, and at the time I thought this phrase, "How you do anything is how you do everything." I was like, oh my gosh, that is so true. And she asked me the question. She said, Ryan, is that actually true? And I thought about it for a moment. She said, one of my clients has the Ferrari, or the Lamborghini, sorry, the Lamborghini, very successful business. However, his belly drops over the steering wheel, she says to me. He struggles to get in and out of the car. And because he's so overweight, he can't be intimate with his wife because <clears throat> premature ejaculation. And because he's working so hard, he's not present with his kids. So he's got stacks of money, no time to utilize it, mm-hmm. spend it with the people he cares about the most. And to me, you know, that really was like, oh, wow, you can be good at one thing and have weaknesses in other areas. Entrepreneurship, I think, as well, when my mastermind, I was mentioning that to you, when when they surveyed the men, they said the men struggle the most with balancing business with their relationship. So I would love to hear from you. What are those standards that you have to allow your, your marriage to blossom? Like why is that so important to you? What are the standards you hold? The first standard is time. And I think where a lot of people get thrown off and, and for us, for example, I used to think balance was what most people chase and what I was chasing. And I had this idea that balance meant equal time. It's impossible to get equal time with things because most people, we're committed to doing X amount of hours at work. We have to sleep for minimum, like six hours, right? Like minimum. Okay. Which leaves us with, let's say eight hours left. So if I'm wanting to train, if I'm wanting to invest time in my relationship, it's just not possible. So that then moves me from balance to intention. What do I, Mm. you know, what are my wants, needs, and desires? So I understand what, you know, a great book, two great books, The Way of the Superior Man and uh, Mm. The Five Love Languages, two great books to really help you with your relationship. I, for years, was getting gifts from Amy all the time. She'd come back from America or whatever and give me a gift. And I'm like, I appreciate that, but I'm not really a gifts guy. And when I read that book, I was like, hmm, that's her love language. She loves gifts. And I'd never give her gifts. I'd be like hugging her and telling her I love her. But whenever I give her something, Ryan, makes her day, like makes her week. Mm. 
Okay, so I realized pretty quickly how f- for us to have a, a very incredible relationship, the first thing is communication, right? We have to be open, honest, and transparent. So we're both very driven individuals. Okay, she's got an extremely ses- successful career, as do I. And we just make sure that when we plan our week, we make time for each other. And sometimes we get a lot of time together, other times we don't. And obviously, I'm in a sprint at the moment, which means we're a priority. But every week, we're still making time for each other. It's, it, you know, we're getting our date nights. We're doing it every fortnight. We're alternating who's in control of designing it. But every night, Ryan, before we go to bed, we have 10 minutes. You know, I say 10 minutes. It's you know, generally a little bit more. But we have to put our phones down and just face each other in bed and talk. It is mm. the best 10 minutes of my day. Like re- genuinely getting to connect. And so while it's not the eight hours like people think, we have a few non-negotiables that we do. And sometimes it's the last thing you want to do, dude. Like a couple of times last week, I've been on the phone all day and I was so tired. But I'm like, dude, I'm making time for all these people. Some of them I have never met, yet I'm choosing or refusing to give my best self to my wife, the person that I'm building a life with. That is bullshit. Get up Mm. and create some energy and then show up how you want to show up. It's so easy, man. And if we look at the, the cycle of life, like there's this bell curve, right? It's ascending, there's the peak state, and there's the descending, the decline, okay? And for many of us, when we're in the relationship, it's like we're ascending, right? It's exciting. You've got the rose-colored glasses on. Your yeah. partner could not do a single thing wrong. Then we hit the peak state. And for me, it's like I don't really know what that is, but I want to assume that every day is the peak. So how would I need to show up to make that the peak? Dude, I, I bring Amy a coffee every morning. Even if I'm, you know, working as soon as I get off a call and I hear she's up, I'll bring her one coffee, give her a kiss, and then back to the office. But that those moments for us, I've got these little moments where we invest in each other, do nice little things for each other. And it's just like I make her feel valued. I make her feel heard. And she does the same thing. And we've done that through communication. But she also knows, Ryan, and I know this is a long winded answer, sorry, but we you know she knows when i'm on a sprint i know when she's on a sprint so we respect each other's boundaries around that like dude it's nearly eight o'clock here at night she's having dinner at another place which i'm sure she'd love me to be at but she understands appreciates and wants me to do well that's why we're on this podcast Hmm. okay and i think when you have a partner who wants to support you and you don't just get there right you have to work on it there's a lot of speed bumps but I think that honest communication, transparency, uh, transparency and the boundaries can really, really help with that and, and just constantly reassessing what's a priority, man. If, if we spent too much time apart, I'd have to reassess and go, look, we've had too much time apart. Work has to take a backseat for a little bit because I really value our marriage. Are you also physical touch or, or like uh, quality time? Yeah, dude. I, I yeah, man, I think every bloke's physical touch, right? <laughs> like, I have not met a met a dude who's like, I'm physical touch. I'm like, yeah, cool. But to be fair, like, if I think of physical touch, it's like I really appreciate holding hands with Amy in public because I I yeah. used to be extremely jealous, very insecure. Okay, so now I don't have. I'm still look. I still get jealous. I'm not going to lie about that. But I do love walking down the street holding her hand. Like, for me, that's nice. But also then. Intimacy is, is, is important as well because I feel like it's a time of like true vulnerability, true expression, and I, I, I you know, I think it's important. Yeah. Um, you sound like you have a very similar arrangement with Amy as I do with my partner, Emily. And it is, I love those 10, 15 minutes before bed. Um, one of the things we introduced last year, Lockie, I'm not sure if you've heard this before. So, I heard it introduced to me as um, meat, M-E-A-T, and we changed it into... No, I'm not familiar. uh, Yeah, so the, I think it was um, team, sorry, T-E-A-M, and we changed it to meat, M-E-A-T. And so what we call it is, this is our little team meeting. And because of work schedules, because we're finishing the day at different times, we're out, whatever it is. And even if I choose to stay up and work a little bit later, the significance of this has been very profound. I'll share what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, So team, T being for touch. And so what you said, where we're looking at each other, 
but we're also touching. And there's the nervous system that. regulation that is occurring as well. You're syncing up your breathing, you're connecting your whatever emotions or things going on for you during the day. You're like, oh, calm. Um, then E is education. So something you've learned in your day, you're just sharing, connecting on whatever that's uh, that you found interesting to learn. A is appreciation. So then you're taking time to appreciate something for that day about your partner that you can acknowledge. Uh, Lockie, I'm so thankful that you brought me a coffee this morning. Actually, it made my day. And then M is metrics. So metrics being business and personal, good, bad, ugly. It's kind of like the high level what's gone on for the day. But the valuable thing, this is what I found it's like such a game changer for us. Metrics is also, hey, this triggers me. This frustrated me about the day. This was annoying. I didn't like when you said this. And the reason why this has been so profound for our relationship is as men, where we're single focused, if we're in the work or we're doing something, for example, or we're out and something we've done has upset our partner, often for women, they might want resolution immediately in that moment. The problem with us is we don't, we don't know what's gone on. We're thinking about the single priority. So we actually have to shift focus to then be fully engaged in this thing be present, resolve it. Now, however long that takes to be, because we got to come out of our presence with whatever it is, the work, doing something else, to then be present with her, to then context switch back into what we're doing can really disrupt. Um, but also what, we also what we found for ourselves is that emotion in the immediacy of a trigger or an upset influences the conversation. So now as the man, we're like, well, what's going on? <laughs> I don't know how you feel. Let's try to understand that first. So our relationship has evolved to, cool, can we pause that for the team meeting tonight? And what that's allowed us to do is go away and to reflect or think about whatever's happened. And when we address it in the team meeting, because we're touching because we're connected, because we're both present, because that has now, like we've made time to do that. All the emotion, all the anger, frustration, resentment, whatever it, it was earlier in the day has dissipated. And so then we can talk about the heart of the matter. That really upset me that you said this, but also I recognize I'm actually on my period today. <laughs> or it wasn't, it had nothing to do with you. There's something else. Like, okay. Um, and it takes 10 minutes too. And it's just been so profound. Dude, I love that. I love that. For anyone listening, the, that framework makes that conversation so easy to have. Because I can imagine there would be a lot of things that maybe I've said or we've spoken about that there might be the how do I do that thing? Because a lot of men get shut down, right? A lot of women say, I want, a, you know, an emotionally connected man or someone who can talk to me about anything. And then they have a crack at it and get shut down. So what you've yeah. just done then, I love that, is this simple framework to just introduce that. I think that's fantastic, man. Yeah, I, I've said it to a couple of clients and it has been such a game changer <clears throat> because for some of them, they would fight in the moment, but then they're or have a disagreement, but then their whole day is disrupted or upset or you're still in the emotion and the, then you're trying to resolve it before bed. But the emotion has actually just like hung around or lingered. And then sometimes when you're disagreeing with your partner, it's like you love them. Now we're not even fighting about the the thing, the actual, <laughs> you know, the actual <laughs> issue. And um, it has been such a game changer. The other one, funnily enough, I we haven't personally tried this yet. I think I'm trying to convince my partner to do it. But someone said, try arguing 
whilst you're facing each other on the floor. So like if you're having a disagreement, you both get down and you lie on the floor <laughs> and you realize that you laugh because you, you can't actually fight with somebody. And it's, it's really like changing your state as the anchor, yeah. you know, and it, it's so interesting, but that stuff works sometimes. Well, the simplest thing to think is that when emotions are high, intellect is low. And you don't solve anything when the intellect's low. So when you can be aware of that, just do whatever you can to regulate the emotion and get back to like whatever homeo like homeostasis is for you or that place where you feel like you can make a, a great rational decision or say something that's rational. And you'll avoid so many, so many problems. Man, I when you know, years ago I used to just flip. Like I coming from the background of like rugby and not learning to communicate well, my, as soon as someone challenged me or something happened, I would just flip, man. And I would always say things that I would regret and find myself in uncomfortable positions because of my ability to not respond well. And I recognize that if I could learn to emotionally regulate myself better, which everyone can do, okay, whether it's using that team um, uh, acronym that you just mentioned and, and going through that process or finding other ways, whether it's breath work or going for a quick drive, putting on your favorite song, laying on the, flower, on the floor and trying to argue. There's ways that you can change your state and that's the most important thing to shift. It's like, what state do I perform best in? Like I mentioned before around giving my best self to Amy, even if I've been on calls all day, for example, or if I've done a marathon or whatever it is and I am tired, it's just like your body can always get that little bit more out of it. But what state do I need to be in? And what are some primers that I have to get myself in that state? Yeah. And knowing, knowing them for yourself, I think there's no point in trying to introduce meditation if, if you don't actually find it useful. I think all these state shifters is what I like to call them. Knowing what the state shifter is, um, just pocket them. Like you got to know yourself. Uh, for me, it's, if I can't do the, the cold plunge, it's jumping in the, the shower, turn, turn yep. it to cold two minutes, boom, state change. Um, when I'd work a corporate job, sometimes I'd go to the bathroom, like the disabled toilet and then do 10 star jumps. <laughs> and then that's that would awesome. Man. Change. I love that. Yeah. Just instantly change my mood. And, um, I think it's it really is about knowing knowing yourself and what is then effective for you. Um, Lockie, I have a couple more questions, man, and then I think we definitely should tee up Fire a away, part dude. two for this. <laughs> I'd love um, to, man. I'd love to. <clears throat> I would love to ask. So, for those listening, and particularly for the men who are tuning in, they're enjoying this conversation. Um, could you share a without revealing the person a transformation that's happened in your man that can community as to what this work has profoundly done for them. Yeah. One of the ones that stand out, cause I was just on the phone to them before actually, uh, was a, a bloke who runs a successful company and had, had a young child. I mm -hmm. won't give away agenda just cause it might give it away, but he, his goal was to, you know, wanted to have another, uh, another kid. But his wife didn't want to have another kid with him because he was always working. He was stressed. He was drinking a lot. And when he first came into our program, I was like, man, I don't think this guy's the right fit. Like, he just seems like super standoffish and angry and whatnot. And literally within three days of the workshop, he was out of his shell, changed. And fast forward even to now, he's got a, another kid who's a couple of years old. So, you know, she, they repaired their marriage and not saying it was broken, but they, really helped to get back on track to where they want it. They knew the love and value and connection was there. He's grown his business by 500%, okay, to the point where he works on it, not in it, which is an amazing thing. And his health is through the, like, incredible some of the stuff that he's doing. So for me, once again, that is validation because a lot of people don't believe that you can have all of that. It's like you can't have it all at once. You've got to build it brick by brick, and it's about understanding which brick comes first for you right? That's different for mm -hmm. everyone. But if you continue working at it, this is the mastery piece. 
you can have complete transformation. And I'm not, it's been hard for him. Like, I'm not going to sit here and just say, he did this program. It was awesome. He's, he's not just done it with me, right? He's done it with, you know, help from other people as well. I'm not going to say I'm the, the king for all of those things, but the frameworks and the awareness that we put into him and by helping him get clear on what it is that he wants and the things that he needs to do and develop and the people that he needs to re- surround himself with has put him back in the driver's seat of his life and now he's made those changes. Love that. And obviously, um, guys, uh, if you're listening to this, I'll drop all of Lockie's details uh, underneath this episode. Um, finally, I wanted to ask you, <laughs> what is next? So you, you mentioned you're growing your community again. What's next for the man that can? What, are you, what exciting developments have you got working uh like you're working on behind the scenes if you can share any of that with us yeah man we um so obviously to get the numbers back up to where they were is the the first and foremost goal but doing that in a way where we provide more support and accountability now so we're in the process of um looking at what an app would like look like whether you know doing the due diligence of whether that would be valuable to the community because quite often Mm -hmm. you know what you think people want you find out pretty they don't and dumping a heap of cash on an app might be the right thing we also have in the pipeline to start a woman that can because that's one of the most requested things is how do members in our community find something for their partners or for their wives it's just not there so um Mm. my idea with that is we've got the frameworks we've got the systems just chatting to a few people around what that would look like um so there's a there's a lot of stuff and then I also just want to drop, like, personally, man, I, I think it's important to have the business goals, but you should be striving for big things outside of that yeah. as well. So I'm looking to do either seven marathons in seven days in seven continents or 50 marathons in 50 states across 50 days in the states here. And is that something you're working well. towards this year? Yeah, I'm just deciding which one because one's extremely capital intensive and I'm trying to work out whether, once again, it's a – great marketing expense or not um both will be fun i think both will be unique experiences same thing got my wife on board and the people that are important in my life with both of those it's just i'm training and i'm I'm definitely believe i could do it i'm not saying it would be easy but i I feel Mm -hmm. like i could it's just which one and uh, what that would look like that's really exciting. We should chat because that sounds like an epic project and it'd be interesting to know, like run run the numbers and then find out like uh, how you could get it sponsored or, or covered in some fun, creative way. Maybe that's a conversation yeah. we can have in Brisbane I've, I've, when you're here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm back in a few weeks. Oh, don't worry, I've been doing all of that sort of um, stuff for sure. Because I think as well, you know, the brand exposure, you get people on board as well. It's just like, because it's, it's got to take more than me anyway, just with a team effort of mm. the food and the driving and the, you know, all the things that I've done physically would not have been possible by myself. That's so exciting. Oh, that's awesome. Um, bro, really great to have you on today. And I, yeah, I'm excited. We sh- I'd love to tee this up in person when you're here in a few weeks and like chat longer and have coffees and snacks because there's a lot of different tangents we can take this conversation in. But um, man, thank you so much, guys. If you enjoyed this episode, I would love it if you were to share this and tag Lockie and myself. Um, Lockie, where's the best place to get in touch with you? Uh, just the man that can project.com and then my like most active on Instagram is at Lachlan Stewart, S T U A R T. But Ryan, I also want to, you know, acknowledge you, dude. Like I love people. It takes balls to put yourself out there and, and create a, I believe a podcast is an extremely vulnerable thing because you're putting yourself out there for criticism. And I often find myself being put on the spot with questions and conversation, but the fact that you're doing it and you're doing it really well is something that inspires me and I love hanging around people like yourself, people who just get after what they want. They don't sit on the sidelines and judge others. They just get it fucking done. Thank you. Oh, it's it's fun. I feel like that's that's a separate uh that's a separate conversation tied into discipline. And I think like even I'd love to hear your take on moonshots because 
in what I hear your personal project is. It's not just a marketing and personal endeavor. It's, it's, if this pays off, this could change everything really as well in, in a lot of ways, the business yeah. and there's that personal sense of accomplishment, but also other doors and opportunities open up, which is exciting and having the balls to go after that, like is amazing. Yeah. I, I learned that. I don't know if you were at Function well when I did, but I did 30 marathons in 30 days on the rower, which was a world record at the time. And what I, I, I learned that. from that, because my sole focus at the time was to bring the community together to get people doing their first fives, tens, twenties and marathons. And we had, I think there was like seven people rode their first marathon, you know, 14 did their first half. Lots of people did fives and tens with us. It was, it was unbelievable to watch it happen. <clears throat> but what I recognized from that was there was a great opportunity to capture um, audiences and, and tell bigger stories and have a bigger impact. But at the mm. time I one, I, I don't think I was looking for it, but I wasn't aware. But looking back, I'm like, damn, missed an opportunity there. So I've definitely got that foresight with the, the next thing as well. Oh, I'm keen to chat offline and throw my network or connections into the ring to make that a reality too, if that's possible. That'd be epic. So um, I heard other people rowing. I didn't realize that you were also the man behind it. So that's really cool. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, Lockie, it's been an absolute pleasure um, having you on the show today. And yeah, looking forward to a part two for sure. Thanks so much for having me on. And I look forward to a coffee and a few snacks when, we're, when I'm back in Brisbane. Beautiful. Have a great day, guys. Thank you for tuning in today. Until next time, ciao for now.